Good morning, salt and light, and welcome to another week of morning glory where we are waking up early with praise on our lips and the peace of Christ on our hearts. This morning, I know it's Labor Day, but you got to get up anyway um, and get your week started off right with our first morning glory sermon this morning from Minister Monique Burgess. Enjoy and be blessed. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Gracious God, we bless and honor your name. Thank you for this day. Hide me behind a cross so that your people can hear what thus saith the Lord. I will be reading from Acts chapter 12, verse 5 through 14, and it reads as follows. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Then came, they passed the first and second guards and came to an iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they walked through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter had come to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt, that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches. And from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked on the door at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She ran back without opening it and explained, Peter is at the door for a thought, theme, or title when a united church pray. Imagine Pastor James was arrested because of his preaching and is facing a death penalty. The church can no longer preach the gospel of Jesus Christ anymore, and whoever does will face the death penalty too. So we gathered together at Salt and Light for a prayer meeting on the night of Pastor James' arraignment. We are earnestly praying to God, and all of a sudden, Arnett bursts into the sanctuary, eagerly to tell the pastor, excuse me, tell us that the pastor is here. One of the congregants says, what are you doing? Why will you interrupt us as we're praying? Arnett says, I'm serious. Pastor James is here. He's in the study. So Deacon Brown begins to get agitated with Arnett and tells him, listen, if you're not going to join us in prayer, then you need to leave. The rest of the church begin to snicker and call Arnett crazy for his untimely and rude outbursts. Then they begin to earnestly pray again. Can you imagine a group of Christian believers responding with such an ununified belief? After all, my story and the story in Act 12 has striking similarities. It's hard not to believe the church wasn't praying for Peter's release when Rhoda interrupted the prayer meeting and announced that Peter was at the door. But for some reason, they refused to believe that God may have actually answered their prayer. Why do you think they questioned Rhoda, even her sanity? What in the world is going on? I know we're so used to reading this text, believing the church was praying for Peter's release, but before we subscribe to that scenario, can there be a more likely explanation in this one? Luke does not tell us what they were praying for. Could it be that this was just a simple prayer meeting at a house church? After all, it was Passover, so it's possible that they gathered at Mary's house to share a Passover meal and then spend time in prayer. Likewise, given the context, it is reasonable to assume that they were praying for Peter's release too. If you read or have read the book of Acts, you will find that the church is constantly praying. In fact, Acts has laid the foundation on how to do church with, with prayer as a good starting point. Prayer is mentioned 
in a form or another, 10 times in Matthew, 12 in Mark, and five times in John. Luke mentions prayer 19 times in his gospel and 32 times in Acts. Luke carefully paints a picture of a church united in prayer. The church was a praying church. The early church was united in prayer, constantly praying. Luke shows a unified church that consists of a body of suffering believers that took God and his word very seriously and with a sense of urgency. In other words, they were proactive, not reactive. This was not a faithless meeting, as some commentators say. They were spiritually mature and knew how to pray. In fact, chapter 1, verse 12 says that they were constantly praying. When something happens constantly, it never stops or changes. Vocabulary.com says constantly comes from the word constant or continual, which is rooted in the Latin word constantum which means standing firm, stable, steadfast, or faithful. The attitude of the early church was that of oneness, and they were united in prayer and faith. I don't believe the early church was a faithless church. They, excuse me, was a faith, excuse me. mm. I don't believe the early church was faithless as they united to pray, and neither do I believe that God wouldn't answer their prayer. I believe they were praying in a different direction than they had been taught in this text. The text did say they were praying for Peter. What it did not say was they were praying for Peter's release. Luke does not explicitly tell us that they were praying what they were praying for. Could it be possible that they were shocked that Peter showed up that night? Just bear with me for a moment. Remember in Acts 4, when Peter and John was arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin because they, they healed the beggar at the gate called Beautiful in Acts 3. The Sanhedrin asked them, by what power or name do you do these things? And Peter was all filled up with the Holy Spirit, told them it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you Christ crucified. But God raised him from the dead. So this man stands right here before you healed. And after Peter and John was released, they went back to the church folk and told them all that happened in the church, raised their voices in prayer. So stay with me. I said Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit when he stood before the Sanhedrin. So in keeping with the precedent of Acts 4, I believe they were not primarily praying for Peter's release, but for God to continue to strengthen Peter to be faithful, to be bold and to be bold and a witness of a good confession of his faith to the end. Y'all remember Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times after he boldly said that he would die before he ever denied Jesus. This is the same Peter who Paul had to check in Antioch because he compromised the gospel with his hypocrisy. I'm not suggesting the church was afraid that Peter would fold under pressure like an old suitcase, but what I suspect Peter knew himself well enough to be transparent about his weakness and need for grace and prayers of the people of God. Neither am I suggesting that there were no requests made for Peter's release. What I'm suggesting is that Act 12 illustrates what a united church look like when they pray. In fact, the entire book of Acts provide a recorded history of how vital prayer plays in the life of the disciples and believers who completely were dependent on God. God uses prayers as a means to achieve his ends. Prayer preceded almost every major event in the early church. Prayer preceded the filling of the Holy Spirit. Prayer preceded multiple healings. Prayer preceded bold preaching. And prayer comforted the persecuted believer too. When a united church pray, we pray not to change God's mind, but that we may get by asking what God has already willed in our lives to be fulfilled by our prayers. Our prayers achieve the acts of God in this world. His providential care enables us to be both recipients and instruments of his sovereignty. Lord, thank you 
for the gift of prayer. May we be of one mind and united in the spirit. Help us to gaze our focus on Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and yet to come. We thank you for all that you have done here at Salt and Light. Help us to put aside personal agendas that may give rise to any ungodly and unnecessary arguments that may cause division. We stand here united and on one accord because we believe our prayers is a sacrificial offering unto you. We believe that prayer connects the natural to the supernatural, the visible to the invisible, the human to the divine, by stabilizing the two realms to coexist in a state of transistence. We know that our prayer is intricately intertwined with your pulsating breath that serves as the object of your power, your strength, and peace in the life of the church, in each individual here. Help us to keep our hearts spiritually attuned to yours so that we can continue to show ourselves to, a, to be a response to your presence and goodness in this world. For it is with these blessings we ask in Jesus' name, amen.